Okay, everyone, uh, I want to welcome you to the fall um, Judaic Studies uh, lecture. We always have, for those who don't know, a, a lecture dealing with some uh, Jewish theme. And we're very happy tonight to have Zev Elif from um, Gratz University, not College no. University, Co Gratz College of Philadelphia. He recently published a book. I think the title we gave to it is Died in Crimson, if you know what Crimson refers to. If not, you'll learn soon enough. Uh, uh, football, faith, the American dream, anti-Semitism, the American dream, I think it was. So he's going to tell us a very interesting story. Um, he'll speak for about 45 minutes, then we'll have some time for questions. So uh, without any uh, further ado, Dr. Zev Elif. Thank you so much, Dr. Shapiro. This unknown, we don't know the artist, but this is the earliest image of American football. 1874, Harvard, not yet the Crimson, facing off in a newfangled game. They were inventing the rules as they were in play against McGill, 1874. And if you take a look at this image, what do you notice? You notice that there's a lot of warfare imagery, right? Ooh. What? This is on? So I'll stay here. All right, so I'll... I got too excited. I forgot all about this. A lot of warfare imagery. You see that there are flags, the Canadian flag, the British flag, against the American flag. You see that there are generals observing the scrum. It evolved from the rugby game. Uh, and that's because in 1874, American men needed something to justify, to legitimize their masculinity. They hadn't fought in the Civil War in some 10 years. And football became a way of describing, pronouncing your self to yourself and to others. What I want to discuss this evening with you, however, concerns an interesting moment in college football. In 1903, Harvard Stadium is built. It's the very first modern-day stadium in the world certainly in the United States. It's built with reinforced concrete in the shape of a horseshoe. You wouldn't have thought that when we talked about the big three in football, we wouldn't be talking about USC, Alabama, and Notre Dame. We'd be talking about Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. And Harvard becomes this interesting crucible in this very white, very Boston Brahmin elite, the most famous university perhaps in the entire world. Harvard becomes this interesting place in the 1920s, 1910s and 1920s for religion. It also was an important place for race, actually, is that Harvard was the very first to admit black people, uh, black men in this case, to their team. Uh, Brown does as well, but in this case, it becomes a really interesting space for religion to play out. And very curiously, the story about a Protestant, a Catholic, and a Jew, it's not a punchline, it's not a joke, becomes a way, a narrative, a language for these very Puritan-like descendants, these Boston Brahmins, to reconsider their entire value system at least briefly. First is Bill Bingham. Sounds like he got off the Mayflower, but in fact, he is a first-generation Irish immigrant living in Lawrence, Massachusetts. Here's Bill over there sitting down. Roy Welton is the one who looks um, probably uh, a little too comfortable on the bottom. Uh, his this is a picture from the Lawrence YMCA. Uh, Bill, couldn't, Bill, uh, Bill Bingham couldn't play football because he had to support his parents and his five other siblings working in the mill. 
in the paper mill. There were two major mills in Lawrence, Massachusetts. Uh, he couldn't go to the morning program, Lawrence High School, which had all of the sports teams. He had to go to the evening program because he had to sweep the mill in the morning. So instead, he found sport in the age of so-called masculine Christianity at the YMCA. He was a deeply devout young man, and his uh, other running mates, he's a track star, he, he's voted captain over Roy Welton. Welton was probably the better, better sprinter for a time, actually competed in the 1908 Olympics, uh, didn't fare that well. Uh, Bill actually decided not to attend the 1912 Olympics, that's quite important. Uh, but for all of his efforts, the most amazing thing happens to Bill Bingham. He is admitted to Phillips Exeter Academy in New England. That is a very big deal because nobody, truly, from Lawrence, Massachusetts, goes to finishing school, goes to a prep boarding school, and certainly none of them go on to college. But here he is at Exeter. The Exeter-Andover game is the most important uh, rivalry in the boys' prep school. Uh, solar system, and here's Bill Bingham, uh, and his team win, crushes Andover 71-25 in total points. Uh, he becomes something of a sensation for that Irish Protestant community. And wouldn't you know it, after never losing a single race, Bill Bingham is admitted to Harvard College. And he eventually, there he is, see the likeness uh, over time, uh, he gets his H, and he is something of a near world beater as captain of the Harvard Crimson. He graduates in, uh, in 1915. Uh, uh, at Exeter, he's invited to the Olympics in 1912. He turns it down in order to uh, march as uh, first marshal in the Exeter graduation. Uh, and because he decides to skip the 1912 Olympics, he makes space for another runner, also from a low-income community. That's Ted Meredith. Well, I mentioned that Bill Bingham would have been a world-class sprinter. He was a middle-distance runner, uh, the quarter mile. Uh, he would have been a world beater had not been for that man, Dandy Ted Meredith. Uh, Ted Meredith beats him on three occasions, also in the joint relay. He races for uh, another important school, the University of Pennsylvania, in the red and blue dismantled the crimson on every occasion. Before we get to Halloween, uh, Bingham leaves despondent. Uh, he never loses a single race while racing for the YMCA in Lawrence, Massachusetts. He never loses as captain, as a racer for Exeter, and he just can't seem to topple Ted Meredith. Uh, uh, instead, he moves to Paris, that's Paris, Texas, not Paris, France, uh, to become a banker, um, feeling that he needed to send himself into exile for not living up to expectations. So that's our Protestant. Our Jewish figure is a man by the name of Arnold or Arnie Harwin. That is little Arnie, the younger boy uh, born in 1898, to Rose and Isidore Harween, and that's his older brother, Ralph. In a book on Chicago Jewish history, uh, there's a discussion about a self-education club or a self-help club for many Jewish immigrants, including Rose and Isidore Harween, who came from what we today call Ukraine. Um, who can't come to Chicago as immigrants and their religion, their faith becomes America itself. The club was conducted along similar lines to the self-educational club. Bernard J. Brown, who had been practicing law in the city for the past 30 years, was the leading spirit of the self-culture club where they taught themselves English and basic facts like George Washington was the first president. Uh, there was something called the Constitution, a civil war, Abraham Lincoln, and just memorizing facts which would constitute a certain kind of American cultural literacy. 
Among those who played an active role in the club were Fanny Shine, who is the present Mrs. B.J. Brown, Isidore Harween, and Rose Rabinoff. They were engaged at the time, and they make it in this world. How do Rose and Isidore uh, persevere and move into middle and then to upper class? Well, as a young man, Isidore Harween was an apprentice to a leatherer, to a tanner. Uh, he didn't make much money. His father died uh, very, very young. And his mother and his sister became egg farmers. Um, and they sent little Isidore in Ukraine to become an apprentice to learn a special art of cordovan tanning. Cordovan, like Cordova, a style type of uh, very delicate um, and, and uh, expensive style of leather. He becomes an expert in cordovan leather. He arrives in the United States in 1893. That's the same year that the Columbian Expedition, the World's Fair, celebrating the 400th anniversary of Columbus, 401st anniversary of Columbus uh, making it to the Western Hemisphere. And he's looking at that. Anybody ever, anybody ever been to Chicago before? So when you're there and you're driving up Lakeshore Drive, you see a very famous, iconic Ferris wheel, right? Take my word for it, it's there. That was Mr. Ferris invented that wheel for the 1893 World's Fair. So that actually that's a replica of the original one, I believe, or maybe even a bigger one than the original. Uh, Isidore didn't have much of an interest in this fair, this newfangled thing called the Ferris wheel. Instead, he immediately went to the leather exhibit. Uh, according to family tradition, in Yiddish with his friend, he starts to scrutinize the various pieces of leather on display. Uh, the person behind him um, looks at him and says, uh, excuse me, sir, but that's my leather. He says, yeah, well, it's not so good. He said, oh yeah, well then show up on Monday to my office. Well, that's what he did. Uh, he shows up uh, uh, for one of the chief leather uh, makers in the city of Chicago, is very good because of access to water in Lake Michigan, and he works his way up, does Isidore Harween, uh, making a life for himself. Well, making a life for yourself and to Americanize is really important. On the one hand, uh, there's a sense of philanthropy and togetherness in the Jewish, a close-knit Jewish community. So in the uh, wake of the Great War of World War I, as Chicago Jews are fundraising for Jewish communities, Isidore Harween is listed as one of the givers. But even more important, to demonstrate that you had made it is that your children attend good schools. Uh, What's, fa what's fascinating about the Jewish concept of what we could call Americanization may be different than the Catholic experience. If you think about it, actually, it's probably important to say here, is that the Catholic idea of Americanization, particularly in the 19th century, was to create parallel systems. Was that uh, if there are great centers of learning, if there's Harvard and Yale, well, we're going to establish Scranton, Notre Dame, Georgetown, Boston College. The Jewish sense of Americanization, I know that we have Brandeis, we have Yeshiva University, but the earliest conception of the Jewish form of Americanization was to acculturate into those existing structures. Again, the Catholic one more or less was, we're gonna create parallel systems and we're gonna beat you on the football field. The Jewish version was to acculturate and One's not better than the other, but conceptually, these communities saw making it in America very, very different. So it was quite a delight when Rose and Isidore Harween's oldest son, Ralph, that's him over there, was admitted to Harvard College in 1915. At that time, the two most well-known people around Harvard, traversing through Harvard Yard, were Percy Houghton, the football coach, and Eddie Mahan, who uh, Jim Thorpe uh, said at 1950 was truly the greatest football player he had ever seen. By 1915, all eyes, after Eddie Mahan had graduated, were on this fellow, Eddie Casey. Eddie Casey is our Catholic figure in our story. He's from Natick, Massachusetts, one of 13 children who grew up on the same block as Eddie Mahan 
in this small town of Natick, Massachusetts. He came with great praise. The Catholic advance first, their presentation and their feelings about some of their Catholic sons attending Harvard College. We were prepared to see four or five strongly Irish names among the list of the Harvard football players, but it rather surprises us to see names like uh, Shevlin and Hogan figuring in the lineup of the, Princeton, of the Princeton football team. Princeton University is more or less a Presbyterian seminary. However, these great institutions of learning must have athletes, and they know what race abounds in such. The idea that the Irish Catholic uh, athlete is superior, and all of these non-Catholic schools are somehow recruiting them away from others. They had much preferred to see those players at Notre Dame with Newt Rockney. Well, here's Eddie Casey, um, kind of small, so you'll have to take my word for it, but he's part of the Natick High School football team that just beat Westboro High in 1911, 74 to zero. And in fact, as this article reports, since October 7th, Natick High has won four games and has scored 282 points to nothing for their opponents. And Eddie was their best player. There was something in the water in Natick, Massachusetts. The little town of Natick, Massachusetts is fast getting recognition as a cradle for football stars. Not only did Eddie Mahan and Eddie Casey, former Harvard stars, uh, who were named on an All-American 11s, come from Natick, 11s because there are 11 players on each side in a football, uh, football team, come from Natick, but Chick Burke, who is one of the present Dartmouth stars, is also, also hails from the little New England Berg. So there's something going on in Natick, Massachusetts, but at a very Catholic town at that. Exeter captain, he follow, he's uh, also uh, like Bingham and Exeter. Exeter was the pathway to Harvard, whereas uh, Andover, you saw before, was a different pathway to Yale. Um, Exeter captain to enter Harvard, that's a story about Eddie Casey. And then to divide Harvard's squad, uh, Massachusetts, this is from the Boston Globe, the size of Harvard's football squad was increased by the arrival of 18 new players today. This is, these are the freshmen. The list including none of the delinquent varsity men, however. The most important newcomer was Eddie Casey. So much ado over this Catholic boy playing for the very fine Harvard team. But in fact, he is outshined, we'll see if that's actually the case, by another player right beside him, in the middle is Arnold Harween. Back to him. Here is Arnold Harween. Uh, his brother Ralph was the first graduating class of the Francis Parker, a liberal school fashioned in the stylings of John Dewey. Here is Arnold Harween. Uh, here's his yearbook photo. Arnold Harween, as president, piloted our perilous way through the freshman year. He was once a profound student. Nothing was too great for his titanic brain to attempt. He paused at nothing impossible was facile to Arnold. With an indomitable will, he could accomplish anything. Lately, he has been resting on laurels already won, resting for next year's struggle for Cambridge. That's where Harvard is, Cambridge, Massachusetts. And the startling tendencies of his earlier youth, so he's gotten a little complacent, uh, um, have been somewhat modified and abated. Splendidly endowed with nature's best gifts, a giant's frame, a superman's brain, he will make his school famous. Here is the Parker Weekly um, with some exploits of, Har of Harween's prowess on the basketball court and the football field. Now, as Harween and Casey, and we'll return back to Bill Bingham, are hanging around Harvard Yard, it's important to know that there was a lot of nativism going around. There was legislation prohibiting migration of Jews and Catholics uh, to the United States, um, and a lot of xenophobia going on, a lot of anti-Semitism, it's still a thing, sadly, um, going around particularly in the 1920s and interwar period. And that's the context that's important to remember just how far these three young men had to go in order to really change, to make that argument, which I am making, which is that they really did something very special at America's most famous university. What special thing do they do? Well, in 1919, after, because of 
the war. Woodrow Wilson suspends college football for two years. Harvard has an informal team, they're called the informals. Uh, Eddie doesn't play for them, but Arnold Harwin does. Uh, football's back in 1919, and the most important game on the schedule for the Harvard Crimson is their usually final clash. It was heresy for them to conclude the season with anybody else uh, against their arch rival, Yale. If you take a look at the banner headline, Harvard triumphant over Yale 10 to three. Eddie Casey dashes for winning scores. Well, the Jewish press didn't actually see it that way. Harween brothers, both Ralph and Arnie playing for the team, triumphed for Harvard. Ralph, this is another piece of, uh, of clippings. Ralph and Arnold Harween, sons of Mr. and Mrs. Isidore Harween of Chicago, Illinois, were in the midst of the toughest scrambling at the Harvard-Yale game last Saturday in November 1919. And football critics attribute Harvard's triumph, it's curious, Harvard football, I just showed you that headline about Eddie Casey. And nonetheless, the Jewish press contends that the, uh, that the football critics attribute Harvard's triumph to their, the Harwin brothers, the Jewish brothers' versatility. As a result of his work all season, and especially during the Yale game, Arnold, uh, Ralph would graduate this year, Arnold stands as the logical choice for the Harvard captaincy next year. That is a big deal in that time. Uh, the only person who might rank above the football coach around Harvard Yard would be the captain. The fact that a non Protestant, a non-Boston elite from the so-called Gold Coast of Boston was in the running to be the captain of the Harvard Crimson for 1920 was a really big deal. Well, in the who's who of college athletics in the American Hebrew, the most well-known person, not well-known today, and that's interesting, uh, certainly not a Koufax or a Hank Greenberg uh, but the face of Jewish sport in 1920, according to a leading uh, American Jewish newspaper, the American Hebrew, was none other than Arnold Harwin. Some took umbrage, like this fellow, Isidore Brown of Syracuse, who was quick to write a letter to the editor thanking the American Hebrew for letting him know that the all-American Arnold Harwin, a fullback, was Jewish, he thought that one of his friends in Syracuse, a Joseph Alexander, was an even better football player who deserved recognition from the Jewish press. The American Jewish public is really interested in Arnold Harween. He represents the very, he puts like an archetype of their form of Americanization. Western contemporaries are making much of the statement that in the Harvard-Yale football class this year, two Jewish boys Ralph and Arnold Harween of Chicago contributed mightily by their brilliant playing to the triumph of the red over the blue. They weren't that interested in Eddie Casey actually scoring the winning touchdown. We have ceased keeping tab, yeah right, on the Jewish lads who are making the varsity teams in the various branches of college athletics. We are aware, of course, that certain coaches may be somewhat prejudiced against Jewish boys and their squads because coaches are not apt to look for athletic material among them. These boys, on account of their proverbially unathletic stock, certain jaundiced view of Jewish masculinity, must show that their metal, must show their metal, excuse me, before they get their chance. On the other hand, we are equally aware of the fact, and this editorial suggests, that no coach will jeopardize his chances of a victory because he does not like a boy's face or name or religious belief. As witness among many others, we have knowledge of the case of the Harween brothers at Harvard. And in another editorial in the Chicago Jewish Sentinel about Jewish brawn, a sense that, these, that the Jewish brain is somehow giving way to the Jewish brawn is an interesting thing in American life. Well, because they were undefeated, they tied Princeton in 1919, uh, Harvard was invited for the restart, it had been on pause for two years, to something called the Rose Bowl. It was the only postseason game in college football at that moment, always pitting the East against the West. Penn was the last uh, Eastern representative before the Great War. Harvard was invited. Now again, it was heresy to finish your season against anybody other than Yale. 
but Harvard was in need of an alumni boost. They were building new buildings, and its president, A. Lawrence Lowell, therefore somehow skirted that uh, Cardinal Plank and allowed that team to travel. It was a big deal by train. It took more than a day's time to travel by rail to Pasadena to compete against Oregon in the Rose Bowl. And once you know it, they weren't called the Ducks then, they were called the Web Feet. Webfoots. Uh, Oregon 11 bows to Harvard 7-6. Touchdown coming on dash by Freddie Church, who actually replaced an injured Eddie Casey. Here is the Harvard team. Here's a postcard. Not very kosher. We brought home the bacon, as you may have noticed. Writes the alumni uh, newspaper editor. A. Harween captain. It, it came true. Arnold Harwin, the, after his defensive prowess during the Rose Bowl, was elected captain of the Harvard 11. Here he is in the middle, holding the football, and he never loses a single game during his varsity career. In his letterman's jacket, his Harvard H jacket, his fellow students rub that jacket for good luck for midterms and finals. Is it breaking down? Again, the editorials were a lit over Arnold Harween's celebrity. Uh, maybe, just maybe, anti-Semitism is breaking down and Jews, thanks to Harween, were somehow breaking through to the American mainstream. And it becomes a household name. Here is uh, a sermon. The physical department may have suffered. It's a sermon delivered about a newfangled thing in Jewish life called the Jewish Center, sort of a, a shul with the pool, a synagogue that has place for a men's club, has a pool, has a basketball court. That was the style in the day of YMCA's and of synagogues. And in this sermon, Israel Goldstein, a well-known rabbi in, on the west side of New York, writes the following, and this is what I want to pay attention to. The physical department may have suffered, so because uh, he's talking about um, incre increasing synagogue education, we may have hampered the development of future Benny Leonard, the great boxer, or Arnold Harween. So he's a household name but the educational work went on undisturbed. The important point is Arnold Harvey needs no, you needed Dr. Shapiro to provide some biographical details on me, but apparently Goldstein didn't think anybody needed to any desc uh, descriptions about who Arnold Harween was. Now here's an interesting thing. Um, <clears throat> Rabbi Louis Newman uh, in the mid 1920s writes a series of uh, articles and a book titled A Jewish University in America. This was before Brandeis, before Yeshiva University, frankly, um, about the need for a Jewish university to provide Jews a safe haven against anti-Semitism. And he tells you the following story. The quota, there was a Jewish quota at Harvard and elsewhere to minimize the number of Jews. Uh, there were as many as 10 to 15 to 20 percent of the Jewish of the population of Harvard undergrads were Jewish, A. Lawrence Lowell institutes a quota in 1922 to minimize it, and a Catholic quota at that. The quota will be kept down to its authorized fraction. Did Harvard realize, this is Louis Newman trying to explain the need for a Jewish university, did Harvard realize when it introduced into its questionnaire the interrogation, so a, a, an application census to determine if somebody was Jewish or not, has there been any change in your family name? Many Jews changed their names. That its football captain of 1920 would have been compelled as an applicant for admission to say that though his name was Harween, his nom de ghetto had been Harwitz. So did Arnie Harween change his name? Did Isidore Harween, was he once Harwitz? The answer is no. The answer, I've seen the ship, we, I have copies of the ship manifest, and Arnold Harween was born Harween. What's interesting is, Harween did change his name, but not like Newman describes it. When Arnie graduates in 1920 and Ralph from law school, they return back to Chicago to work in Harween Leather Company with their father, but they still have the football itch. So the papers report the following account. Captain Patty, Patty Driscoll, who's in the National Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio, star quarterback of the Chicago Cardinals by then the NFL had started just a year prior, will appear in a new role against the Akron Indians at Normal Park Gridiron at two o'clock in the afternoon. Patty, why is he shifting positions? Has shifted his base of operations to left halfback, became a running back, no longer the quarterback. 
making way for quarter uh, at quarter for McMahon, former Harvard ace. Hmm. Never heard of him before. I know something about Harvard football. Well, here's the story. Here's the scoop. Another report had it. Play as McMahon. And here's a little side story. The Harween brothers, remember, they had returned from Harvard back to their parents' house in Chicago. The Harween brothers went to the management of the Cardinals. We want to play, they said simply, and, and who might you be, queried Patty Driscoll, formerly a star at Northwestern in the Great Lakes training station team during the Great War. Who might you be? Well, I'm Arnold Harween, and this is my brother Ralph. Good Lord, gasped Driscoll, not the Harweens. Well, that's fine. We'll play you up. It was good business. Why, I've got newspaper friends that'll no, you won't, said the Harweens, and they explained. We'll be McMahons, using an sort of Irish pseudonym. They said, a sort of a working class um, affect, we, which is terribly racist. Uh, we want to be anonymous, we don't want publicity, and we don't want a whole lot of money. Their parents were wealthy by then. We do want to play football, and play football they did. So Arnie and Ralph Harween return from Harvard. They did not switch their names from Harwitz to Harween to get into Harvard, but to get into the NFL, they changed their names from Harween to McMahon. Uh, there are two explanations that are offered by the Harween brothers over time. The first is they did not want to besmirch Harvard by playing under their real names. At that time, only working class people played professional football. It was on Sunday, that was God's day. You know, upstanding people didn't do that. And without disability insurance, the only people who would risk playing football, remember you didn't practice, you weren't in shape, you didn't have the technology and the uh, medical staff and training that we have today, the only people who would take a risk on making a couple bucks to play football were people who needed the cash. Well, there was a whole group of Ivies, of Ivy Leaguers who would play and football was based in the Middle West in that moment, and the Harween brothers wanted to play. They did not want to though play in the CD League and besmirch Harvard or the other legend is that Rose Harween, their mother, told them that she had worked too hard to Americanize for them to be playing and to somehow sully the good Harween name. They had to change it, and so they went under this working class Irish name. Again, kind of a little bit a lot racist. Well, a little bit back to football. Harvard's doing pretty well. If you take a look at some of those numbers, here's the, uh, here's the budget sheets. Uh, Take a look, total revenue for basketball is $2,000 a year in 1927. Baseball is 50,000. Wrestling is $150. Football, anybody see that number? 130,000 gross revenue for the Harvard Crimson football team in 1927. The next year it goes up to 900,000 to then, right before the depression, 915,000, way more than any sport. Harvard needs football. And here's a ticket to get to that uh, Harvard-Yale contest in 1920, Arnold's uh, last game as captain of the Crimson. Well, it's good money because Harvard's doing well, but by 1925, Harvard isn't doing that well. And Coach Bob Fisher, who took over for Percy Houghton, is given the outs. Details of Fisher's retirement uh, bared it was a forced retirement, and Harvard, by 1926, is looking for a new coach. And wouldn't you know it, who do they find? Well, first they find an athletic director. We'll get back to him in a second. But they find Harween. This is the front page of the Chicago Tribune. Harween, Chicagoan to lead Harvard. Played pro football here for years. Son of Russian Jewish immigrant to coach Harvard football team. Now, this is a fellow who went to a very fine private prep school. Francis Parker, he played and attended and graduated from Harvard, and the press is, re is reducing his personality, his entire profile's biography, to a son of a Russian Jewish immigrant. And in fact, the Chicago Tribune article begins, Arnold Harwin, a Chicago boy of Jewish descent. So he is very squarely, although he wasn't very punctilious in his Jewish observance, uh, he is known very ethnically and religiously as a Jew. Son of Immigrant comes out west to coach the Crimson. Now, wouldn't you know it, he's hired by the very first athletic director in college football history, Bill Bingham. Bill, 
who was not very successful as a runner. He always came up second place to Ted Meredith of Penn, who had exiled himself to Paris, Texas, had come back in 1923 to coach the track team at Harvard. And in 1926, he was asked by A. Lawrence Lowell to become the very first athletic director. And he, there's a lot of controversy at Harvard. Uh, the boosters, the alumni are obsessed with winning. Well, winning and, and, and at all costs was a Yale thing. It was a Princeton thing. That's not how Harvard did it. Harvard won, but also had fun doing it. And a lot of the sports alumni were coming out against, Har against Harvard. And so Bill Bingham's campaign was to give the sport back to the players again. He didn't want somebody with a, a Lowell last name or a Cabot he didn't want somebody like a Houghton, like a Percy Houghton, to be the coach. He wanted to find a role model who would demonstrate fun, who would teach the Harvard men to love sport, to love football again. And eventually they hire, after an exhaustive search, they hire Arnie Harwin, a former Harvard Crimson, but also former NFL player, to coach the team from the Middle West. Here they are together, and the Alumni Association, the selection of Arnold Harween in 1926 to be head coach of the Harvard football team, has been universally commended. Well, not exactly. Here's how it went down. In January 1926, Henry Pennypacker, who was the director of admissions who executed the quota system to deny Jews and Catholics entry to Harvard College, was also a member of the search committee for the new head football coach. So this is a terrific piece, I mean that uh, facetiously, of anti-Semitism. Dear Fred Moore, the head of the search committee for the football, uh, for the new football coach. At the Harvard Club luncheon here, this new he's in Chicago, a very strong plea was made for the consideration of Arnold Harween as head coach of football, or failing that as assistant coach. He has had much successful experience both in playing and in coaching the Cardinals, a professional football team here. And these men say that he's only, anybody read that? Half Jewish. His mother being of Greek nobility. It's not true. Rose was fully Jewish. So um, for that, he was acceptable, according to Henry Pennypacker, to be the head coach of the Crimson, he advised Fred Moore and the other search committee members to take a look at Harween's resume. Well, again, this was January 26th. By the time uh, Penny Packer takes a train to Houston, he writes, since writing you from Chicago, I have spoken, this is back to Fred Moore, with a considerable number of men in this part of the country. And I am really doubtful if we could expediently invite any member of the Hebrew race to become head coach, no matter how skillful he might be. There is a settled feeling, apparently very widespread, that we must do something at once to check certain growing influences and that Arnold Harween's appointment at the present ticklish, because of the quota system, situation would be perilous. So he removes the candidacy, but it's too late. Bill Bingham has found him, and Arnold Harween is elected head coach of the team. Uh, here is some anti-Semitic cartoons. Uh, first of all, we'll get rid of that. Harween, who has learned about interesting football play in the Middle West, it's there that they invent the forward pass. By then, Eastern football was all about running it. Nobody passed the ball. In fact, early on in 1905, when the pass was legalized in professional, in, in college football, excuse me, uh, an incomplete pass warranted a 15-yard penalty. So it was very, very discouraged to pass the ball. But Harween invents and he experiments with it and he learns about these things in the Middle West. <clears throat> it's inherently on New England. He's Jewish. He played CD professional football. He is unmaking <clears throat> the Harvard way of doing things under Percy Houghton. He's to your right. <clears throat> now, everybody outside of Harvard loves him. Here, there's much anticipation uh, for Harween in the cap to lead the squad against Dartmouth and the like. But other people are really, really scared, really, really nervous. Amo, Amo Alonzo Stagg, the head coach of the University of Chicago football team, he writes about him in his memoir. In a conference, we have, that being the Big Ten, uh, it was called the Big Eight back then. Uh, in the conference, 
Uh, they had two more teams added. We have drawn the line as sharply as we have known how, how and have made ineligible for any coaching position anyone who has played for hire. No professionals, former professionals, are allowed to coach a Big Ten football team. That alarm has not extended to the East. Arnold Harween, who became head coach of the Harvard squad last fall, played professional football under the name of McMahon. It was an open secret of the Chicago Cardinals up to the time of his Harvard appointment. Another knock on Harween from the Washington Post. Yet if he winds up uh, yet, if he winds up his college days on the gridiron in a blaze of glory, he is immediately considered by some colleges as a man to place them on the football map. In business, excuse me, business circles, a man usually rises to the top in his field only after years of real effort. When he finally reaches his goal, <coughs> he, his experience goes a long way to keep him there. When a college or a university seeks a head, he doesn't, it doesn't look to some recently graduated student. He was also a young man. Brilliant though his collegiate academic career may have been, yet, in, uh, yet it sometimes expects a youth just out of college to compete against the brains and experience of rival coaches long in the field. Arnold Harween was Jewish. He was not an Easterner. He did newfangled things like pass the ball like a Midwesterner. He was young and he played professional football. Any of these five ought to have disqualified him from being the head coach of the Harvard Crimson, and yet Bill Bingham, because of his Lawrence, Massachusetts, mill hand experience and his campaign to give sport back to the kids, chose him anyway. He was an innovator. Arnold Harween in a manual of football is credited. Another type of pass, which was developed at Harvard by Arnold Harween for this type of play, is the two-handed toss from over the shoulder. This pass is probably more difficult to master than the straight push pass, but it is very effective when perfected. Well, it's hard to understand, so here's some footage. This is the Harvard team under him. So what is the play that Arnold introduced to college football? I think it's coming up right here. Right here. Ah, it went really fast. But if you saw, the quarterback handed it over to the running back who handed it over to another end. Arnold Harween invented the quarterback option. It didn't go so well in his first season. 1926, Harvard was three and five. But then again, Arnold was working with Fisher's stock. He didn't recruit any of those players. And most importantly, if you look at their last game against Yale, they lost 12 to seven. 1927 went a little bit better. They were four and four, but it didn't matter much because to Harvard, all that really mattered was that final game of the season. And they lost on November 19th, uh, 14 zip to Yale. 80,000 forget dismal season as Yale and Harvard clash. Nobody's paying much attention to Harvard football anymore, apparently. However, Harvard-Yale game relegated to a rear seat. Other tilts on uh, to hold fans' interest Saturday. And that's a picture of Ronnie Harmon. However, this is my however, Bingham declares football a success. Despite Booster and alumni disinterest in college football because they're not winning games, Arnold Harween is something of a success. Game has been given back to the boys. Harvard sponsors athletics for all. Here's Arnie uh, teaching the uh, undergrads to play. Harween rates highly with Harvard men. Harvard stops Albie Booth. He's in the College Football Hall of Fame, Albie Booth, and defeats Yale 10 to 6. Harvard is jubilant. Players are dined. Director Bingham urges Harween to return as team celebrates this in 1928 and disbands, meaning they ended their season. So Arnie Harween is encouraged to come back. And so he does. 1928, they are five and two. And like you saw in Albie Booth, they had vanquished on November 24th, right before Thanksgiving, 17 nothing. They beat Yale at Yale, the Yale Bowl. Harvard didn't like to play away games. You see that most of the place they played in the stadium because that meant they got the revenue. 1921, they were five and two. Wow. 
Why are they fight? Who did they lose to? Well, they tried their hand against Michigan, lost 14-12, and the other loss was to Dartmouth. That was a bit of a trouncing, 34-7. In 1930, they're 4-4 in close games, but they shut out Yale 13-0. All the while, Harvard, uh, Harween in, uh, chooses as his assistant coach, Eddie Casey. And he, Eddie Casey, is selected as the successor to Arnold Harween when he finally leaves in 1930. Harween's achievement at Cambridge was to repopularize football among the players, to make them like the game. Casey is believed to be an ideal leader to carry on Harween's policy, while at the same time abandoning many of the latter's football tactics that have been accepted against Yale, barren of major victories at Cambridge during the last five seasons. So maybe he'll be a, I'll introduce a new offense, but at the same time, the same virtue, the same value of making sport fun again is to be carried on from the Jewish coach to inexplicably the very first Catholic coach in, Harvard, in Harvard's history, that Natick gridiron giant, Eddie Casey, who is actually in the College Football Hall of Fame. In his speech, his farewell speech, Bill Bingham, in the triumvirate, says the following. Arnold Harween will be remembered by the present generation, and I guess we're accomplishing this tonight, and I hope his legacy will be passed on because of his human attitude to the boys and to the game. Not once during his five years of coaching have I seen him lose his temper on the field. Never have I heard him swear at a boy, nor have I heard him make an uncomplimentary remark about an opponent. He loved the game of football and made the boys love it. Often have I heard him say, this is a rough, tough game, and we love it because it's a virile game. Allison Danzig, that's a man's name, uh, who was the top sports writer for the New York Times in 1930, makes one final unsuccessful plea to Arnold Harween to stay. At, by then, uh, he had married uh, Mary and Eisendrath. Eisendrath, was, she was the daughter of a leatherer. It was Eisendrath, uh, Mr. Eisendrath, was the person who Isidore Harween encountered at the uh, World's Fair, who invited him to work for him that Monday morning. Uh, so he got married did Arnold Harween, and it was time to hang it up and take over the business side of Harween Leather Company in Chicago, which still exists to this day. But Arnold Harween is one coach, writes the New York Times sports columnist, who never has been concerned by the possible costs of defeat. He has taught football not because it is a, a science, -er, but on the con for on the contrary, his work at Harvard has meant a financial sacrifice. Could have made more money working for his dad. He has taught it because he honestly loves the game and its associations, particularly the associations with the young men who sit at his feet and who have come to have so high a regard for him and so deep an appreciation for the wholesomeness and the sanity of his methods and outlook that they sign petitions to keep him in harness and cheer when he smilingly capitulates to their demand as he has done for the last two years. Maybe he'll stay. Arnold Harween is so much bigger than victory. It's the New York Times. I'm not giving you some, uh, you know, some peripheral newspapers. The New York Times. Arnold Harween is so much bigger than victory. His type is so priceless an asset to the game, particularly in this period of charges and countercharges, that one cannot but hope that he will be persuaded once again somehow to stay in the pigskin game a little longer before returning to the leather industry. It didn't happen. In the pages of the Jewish newspaper, this one from the B'nai B'rith Messenger in Los Angeles, Lewis Brown to send more dope, that meant information, not drugs, uh, of Harvard athletes in interview with Coach Harween would sit well, but it turned out because of the fall of Harvard football and the rise of professional sports, the Jewish world didn't need Harween very much because on a column right beside it, another little piece of information innocuously reported by the Jewish press, Henry Greenberg, Hank Greenberg, first baseman of the Raleigh Club of the Piedmont League has been recalled by the Detroit Tigers. 
in the end, what this background and the values and the idea of making it, of fulfilling an American dream, although not exactly the same between this Protestant Bill Bingham who took a chance because of his upbringing, his experience with fairness and hard work in the mills of Lawrence, Massachusetts, of hiring a Jewish guy like Arnold Harween, who didn't grow up middle, oh, working class, excuse me, was very much an upper middle class fellow, but somebody who took for granted that anybody who tries really hard and determined can make it at Harvard or anywhere else. And because of his relationship with an Eddie Casey, who absorbed that same spirit and grew up on the not so easy streets, one of 13 boys, 13 kids, excuse me, mostly boys, uh, in the Casey clan in Natick, Massachusetts, it's that upbringing the idea, it's almost like, sounds like a Lin-Manuel Miranda parable, but it's true, that somehow all of these first generation Americans, these three sons of immigrants, counterintuitively taught the Brahmins of football a thing or two about football, a thing or two how to love it, but more importantly than, more important than any of those items, about the possibilities of making it with an American dream. Thank you so much. And we have time for a couple questions. I'll start by saying, you know, Jews used to be very involved in sports, basketball, boxing. Uh, now Jews are more often found in the back room. Uh, yeah. Would not uh, out. Uh, any thoughts on what happened? Why Jewish participation in sports? Now when we see a basketball player or a baseball player, it's a really big deal. Why Jews in sports really is uh, something that ceases to be important. Well, so uh, it's hard to... It's a good question. It's a good question. I have an example of how that actually is part of the Harween, the, the sequel to all of this. Maybe I'll tell that first. Is that um, Arnie Harween, um, what also ended, according to Har Harween and Hallis family tradition, George Hallis's career. Hallis was the owner, the coach, and the star player for the Chicago Bears. Well, while playing as McMahon for the Chicago Cardinals, he, he committed an open field tackle against the speedy, the swift-footed uh, George Hallis, and he realized that if Harween can tackle me, then I, I've lost a step, so he retires. But because of that relationship and because of the proximity of Wilson Sporting Goods, which was still to this day is headquartered, I believe, in Chicago, they would, that football was an ostrich size type of oblong ball, and it becomes slimmer and slimmer until Tom Brady made it even a little bit more slim. And, um, and they needed to experiment with the ball, and they experimented at Chicago Bears football games. But they needed a lot of leather to develop prototypes. And so the account for the production of leather for all Wilson leather products became Lar Harween Leather Company, which is one of the main reasons why Harween Leather Company is still around today and its competitors like Eisendroth aren't because Harween to this day still provides all of the leather for all of your mitts and all of your footballs and all of your basketballs. Why Jews have gone into the back end of things? I think it's a lot to do about risk taking and about opportunity. The quota system for Jews ends by the 1940s, 1950s, and all of a sudden, more Jews are able to attend medical school. They're able to be more involved in politics, in mainstream politics. And so with other opportunity means the concentration of energies is less focused on sport and then other things. And they make way for other communities who are in a different sociological circumstance to find a sport avenue. Uh, but I think a success in sport, when you're talking about a certain ethnic or religious community, has a lot to do about access and opportunity versus anything more than that. It was a great opportunity to tell my football story. Any uh, questions or comments? Uh... So footballs were made of pigskin? Yes, not any longer. No, 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 not any longer. No. But we don't weren't. have football here. Uh, Small university. But, yeah. What do you want to say? One, one other thing I want to ask you, if you have any thoughts, it's not just so relevant to what you spoke about, but uh, how about the injuries in football? I mean, um, 
Was there any discussion years ago, like today, people will say, you know, it's not something that uh, I think most middle class or upper class so that relates to the forward pass. kids to do that. So I mentioned that the, the forward pass was uh, legalized in 1905. That's because Teddy Roosevelt, President Teddy Roosevelt, summons uh, Percy Howden, Walter Camp, and all the other uh, great names in early college football to the White House to discuss what to do because there are a number of fatalities and injuries in college football. There wasn't yet the NFL, that's not until 1920. So there are a lot of, not about concussion, but about real big injuries. In fact, Harvard uh, stops playing Princeton because Princeton cheats and injures people too much. Um, what happens from that fateful 1905 meeting is the uh, introduction of the forward pass because it would spread the game out. It wouldn't be a bruising running game as much. And the establishment of the NCAA as a body to regulate and officiate the sport. Uh, so it's very much on the minds back then. Also, they didn't have the same uh, uniforms we do to protect them. Maybe. And they certainly saw pictures of it. They had a, just a little leather cap. Yeah. Well, if there's no other uh, questions or comments, uh, we just want to thank you for coming That's up great. from Philadelphia today and uh, giving us a bit of American history. Thank you.